I have to start with uh, an honest admission that uh, the passage we're going to look at today is, uh, is really tough, actually. Um, actually, let me clarify that. It was, it's been really tough for me. The story behind this is that I had intended to preach this passage before Christmas, and not only did some of the events of my week, but also just my understanding of this text in December was just not, I, I didn't feel like I really had enough to, 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 to explain it well. And so over Christmas, I thought about it some more, wrestled with it in my mind, and I came back to it this week, hoping things had changed, and it was still the same words as it always is, and I was still stuck, feeling like I needed to keep working at this. And um, even this week, I've, I felt like I've gained some information, some knowledge, some understanding, and yet it's come slowly. And when I went to go and write and say, okay, how do I present this in a way that is helpful for people to put it into a sermon, it was really frustrating for me, not just in the middle of the week when time was kind of ticking away, but also at the end, it got really stressful for me. And so here we are. I know that I can't even count how many times I've restarted trying to explain this. And uh, I think what I realized late Friday is that what I was trying to do was that I wasn't applying the point of the passage to my life. And I was trying to do something that the passage is actually saying you don't have to do. You don't have to worry about it. And I want to explain how this works. The the culture of Corinth, one of the things, actually the highest thing that they prized in that culture was wisdom. Everyone wanted to know what the highest, the greatest, the best knowledge of how to live life well. I think we still ask that question, but we want to know, am I living to the fullest? How do I get the most fulfillment out of my life? And so everyone was talking about this. They had public speakers and books and ideas that were presenting the ways and the philosophies of how you should live your life to the full, and here's how you should do it. There was a countless countless amounts of options to choose from, and typically, since there was so many, people would often choose or embrace the one for their life, the one that was probably the most attention-grabbing, the most compelling to them, logical, reasonable, and the one that was most memorable. And so all of these people were hearing all of these advertisements for how to live life well. And so presentation became very important. People started to equate the value of a philosophy with how it was presented. The packaging equaled the product. And so Paul, the apostle, is preaching all over the world, and he comes into this culture, and the question is now, well, how do you get Jesus, how do you get the gospel to actually have an audience when there's all these other alternatives out there? How should, how should Paul preach the gospel in a way that gets people's attention, that makes them think, yeah, this, this is the right way, this is better than all the other ways? And Paul begins in chapter 2. He tells us his strategy. And what we find there is that he didn't try to make Jesus sound way more exciting than everything else. He didn't add, you know, big flashy lights to the stage. He didn't try to be relatable by telling jokes. He he didn't try to just act with confidence. And he also didn't avoid talking about sin and the crucifixion of Christ. Instead, he intentionally avoided being flashy like all the, other, uh, all the other options. And he didn't try to be overly eloquent to try to get people's attention and make, him, make them think that this, is, this has got to be the right way. Not through those means. He simply spoke God's truth and let God's spirit do the work. And when it came to the results of his preaching, that's what he did. He trusted That even though the world might say this is foolish, and we've talked about that for a while in chapter 1, the world says this is foolish, he says, that's okay. I'm still preaching it, it's still wisdom, and God will convince people to put their faith in Jesus. And perhaps God has intended my personal struggle this week to illustrate how he truly convinces people to put their faith in Jesus. That as much as I want to create something that is helpful, that helps people to understand, perhaps he has called me to simply speak the truth that is in his word. 
and in a way that I typically don't, and I need to apply this to myself. And so it, it is not because of the preacher. It is not because of how they present it. But the way that people believe the gospel is the Spirit and His revelation in our hearts. It was already Friday night when I committed to simply just trying to write out what I understood and to allow, to trust that God will, by faith, He will strengthen faith, He will produce faith in us. He does the work so that in chapter 2, verse 5, it says that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So I want to read this passage. It is somewhat complicated, and, uh, and then I want to try to explain this. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, or 6, verse 6 to 16. He says, Yet, among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? And so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting the spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." So this section, after Paul has admitted that his preaching of the gospel doesn't match seemingly the skill and the style or the flair and, and all the hype of all the other options, all the other messages that are trying to convey wisdom and, and, and a rule or a way of life. And in this book, he's already said that it doesn't seem to other people like it's worth consideration, that it's actually going to lead to more fulfillment in life than all the other alternatives. And it doesn't sound like it offers wisdom at all, but it sounds foolish to everyone else. And even though he admits all of those things, he begins verse 6, he says, yet. He says, although that may be the case, that that's what it looks like, even still, we do impart wisdom. And here he's not just speaking of himself. He doesn't say, I impart wisdom. He says, we. He's not just speaking of himself. I think he's speaking of the apostles. And I think we can include anyone who preaches the same message of the cross of Christ. That they may appear foolish. They may sound like they're talking about foolish things. But they are certainly, actually, giving out wisdom and as we'll see, wisdom from God. It is the best wisdom, the wisest way for anyone to embrace how to live their life. And whether it sounds like it or not, Christ crucified announces supreme wisdom for ultimate fulfillment in life. Now, he starts by saying the reason why it is that people don't, don't typically see it. They, don't, they hear the gospel and they don't see this as wisdom at all. And it's because it's totally foreign to this world. In verse 6, he compares it with the wisdom of this age. And he says, you know that wisdom? It, it's not like that. It, it's not what we are so used to being told. Especially at this time of year, the first week of January, the world is constantly telling us, here's how to be better. Here's how to live better. And it doesn't say the same thing as the gospel. Typically, it's saying, well, here's the way that you can live a good life and find joy and happiness more than last year. 
You can look to exercise and eating healthy. That's the way to do it. Or you can improve your, your self-image and build an empire of influence through that. That's how you can have a better life. Or maybe they say that you can stay mentally sharp by doing these things, even into old age, so that you can still enjoy life with, with having that intelligence still being sharp. Or maybe it requires, you know, here you, you need to have better sex, or you need to climb the corporate ladder, or you need to make more money. All of these things are the things that the world is telling us will lead to more fulfillment. And, and this is how the world works. This age is always pushing us to, to, to focus on ourselves. It markets self-promotion through hard work to increase our value in this world. And that's going to lead to success and fulfillment and joy in this life. And if you don't know exactly how to do that, there are special people with special knowledge that will help you. See, verse 6 also mentions there's the wisdom of the rulers of this age... These are like the experts, the ones who claim to have more knowledge and the right knowledge for how to do these things well. So instead of just saying you need to exercise, these are the kind of people that are going to say, this is the exercise that is most effective. Or this is the precise diet that you need to have to get those results to lead to happiness. Or here's some of the habits that you can instill in your life to be more likable, to other people, to be more influential. You need to take these courses, play these games to keep smart. You need to build intimacy, but these are the ways that you should do it. You need to negotiate like this to get that promotion. And we also know the investments that you need to make that will guarantee a return this year. See, all of these things, all of the experts are trying to tell us that they know the latest information. They have the latest technology to be able to tell you how to achieve or obtain the joy and fulfillment of living life to the full. And all of this here is the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of the rulers of this world. And, and we're so used to hearing this stuff. We can't be so naive that we haven't ever thought that, you know what, this, this is what I want. These are the things that I'm looking for, and they might just be the ticket to a better life, a better 2024. And, and they call to us. And the reason why they do is because they're endorsed by trending celebrities. And they have all the research to back it up with these very colorful graphs. They add these convincing before and after photos. And they promise results within 30 days. See, we're naturally drawn to this kind of thing. And the reason why is because we live in this age. But the Bible doesn't see time as just start and finish. It sees time, all of time in ages. There is more than one age. We live now in a present, evil, sinful age, but there is a sinless one to come. And so verse 6 makes it clear that the wisdom of the gospel, the wisdom, the reason why it seems so foreign is that it's not of this age. It's not of those who are of this age. And this age is doomed to pass away anyways. In other words, we presently live at a time that will eventually come to an end. This era of time, the way that God has established the world, will come to an end and a new one will fully take over forever. And therefore, though we have been born into this age, we would be foolish not to consider the age to come. How things will go for us there not just here. The one, that age that matters the most because it will last forever. But having lived in only this age and being so disciplined by it and, and dependent upon it and its wisdom for us, the wisdom of this age has caused us and everyone to hear the gospel, to hear about Christ and even him crucified and say, that is foolish. That's not a way of life. That is not what I want for my life. This age has conditioned us to desire the firmness of our stomach more than the forgiveness of our sins. It makes us think that we need to lay claim to our position here and power instead of sacrificing here and serving. It tells us we need to gain the whole world at the expense of our souls. And if we really think about this, it is short-sighted. 
The wisdom of this world is actually senseless. It's immature. And, and you see what Paul's saying in verse 6, that the wisdom he's offering, the gospel is offering wisdom, but it is for the mature. Meaning that those who are immature are those who only live for this age. They're only thinking about today and what's going on in this age, but the mature are thinking beyond that. They see further down the road. They see the age to come. So if you think about it, Christ crucified is irrelevant if this age is all there is, right? But in light of the age to come, Christ crucified is invaluable. And for those who can see more than just the here and the now, the gospel is wisdom to be properly prepared for the there and the after. And so Paul explains in verse 7 that the gospel, this is the kind of wisdom it is. It is a secret and hidden wisdom of God. It's for the mature, those who actually can see more than just this age. It's right there in the gospel. It's being offered to us all the time through the gospel, through Christ and yet we're missing it. People are not, it's not obvious to them. Like the parables that Jesus came, he spoke about the kingdom of God. Some people got it, but other people had no clue what he was talking about. It's there, and yet it's hidden. And verse 7 explains that this is the way that God has chosen to work, that his divine plan was to keep this hidden. It says there in verse 7, God decreed that it should be this way. It should remain hidden, and he did this. He chose this before the ages began. And so he knew what he was going to do before time as we know it began, and he kept it hidden for a time. He kept it hidden from the world. It's there, it was unfolding, but we couldn't see it. Before time began, he set in motion his plan to send his own son into the world to save sinners, even through a crucifixion, but he didn't announce it all at one time. In fact, keeping it a mystery like this, all the way until Jesus came, lived and died and rose again, all of that unfolded in real time, but he kept it hidden until then. And he says, somehow, verse 7 says, that it was for our glory. This was for our good that he would do it this way. And perhaps one of the reasons why this is good is because if he told us, we all would have walked away. This room would be empty. We would never have imagined or believed that this is the way that God would save us, would bring us into eternal life, into the age to come. And so maybe that's how this means. I don't understand, perhaps, all of the benefits of having done it like this, but I do know that by keeping it hidden and then unveiling it, we would not have seen it this way. And what actually happened by sending Christ and crucifying on a cross in our place for our sins to grant eternal life in the age to come by grace, all of this, this whole plan was for our glory. And all this is offered plainly through the preaching of the gospel. This is what God had done. He says, I'm telling you it. Do you see it? Do you understand It's not like the wisdom of the world. It's hidden, but you can see it. It's there if I'll show it to you. But the world doesn't understand this. And don't be surprised. Paul says in verse 8, he uses an illustration, a real-life one, that vividly shows how how this is true. None of the rulers of this age understood the wisdom of God in Christ. They didn't understand it. And I would imagine that he could say this with confidence because when Christ came, Even to those who met him in the flesh, they spoke with him, they heard him, they had no idea what he was talking about. Because it says, if they did understand, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have crucified him. The Son of God comes into this age to offer eternal life into the next age, and the people who saw him in the flesh had no idea. And and they did more than just say, "That's, that's foolish, Jesus. And to reject him. No, they despised him. They nailed him to a cross. They fully did not understand this. And this confirms what Isaiah the prophet had spoken long ago. The Lord had declared through him. In verse 9, Paul quotes it. He says, No eye has seen, 
nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Nobody has seen or heard or even imagined it. They, they couldn't. And not just because we're so focused on the world, but because God had kept it hidden. Nobody knew this. Nobody guessed it. And as the prophet was looking ahead, at the time, his people, God's people were in exile. They were scattered, they were sinful, and God punished them for their sins. And Isaiah's wondering, he's looking into the future. God, you promised, he wasn't speaking specifically of heaven here, although we often use this verse for that. He's speaking about, what is it, God? You promised that one day, you gave us hints throughout the Old Testament, not clearly, but enough to say that there will be a day when a ruler will be raised up by God, and he will deliver his people from all their enemies, even their sins, and he will establish a kingdom, gather all of his people, and rule in righteousness forever. That is the age to come. But how is God going to do this? That's what Paul, or that's what Isaiah was looking to, and that's when he says, no one has ever guessed. And I don't think Isaiah even understood it at the time. He was wondering, how is God going to save? And this knowledge and this wisdom that was just unfathomable had now come into the world. No one would have guessed that it would have been the glorious Son of God Himself in the likeness of men. And when He came, they crucified Him. Some people may have thought, He is the Christ, right? He is the one. And then He died and everyone gave up hope. Maybe those rulers of the world were right to crucify him. He wasn't the one. And then astoundingly, we see that even God had planned the crucifixion so that he would rise from the dead for our glory. See, all of this is, is just baffling to us. We, we don't understand what God was doing, and yet here we are, even us today, are saying, we get it now. Somehow, we get it. So how does that happen? How did we go from being unable to understand the gospel, to see what God is doing, and to say, this is wisdom for life, for eternal life. How do we go from that to believing? That's the question. How does anyone believe this if no one can understand it? And Paul says in, in verse 10, these things, the things, the wisdom of God, has been revealed to us by the Spirit. It's by the Spirit. So he's comparing, I think, the apostles who were simple men, some fishermen, some others, tax collectors and whatnot, these men understood it. And yet the rulers of this age had no clue. How did that happen? The wisest people in the world couldn't figure this out. But then these simple people who followed Jesus got it. And he says it's through the revelation of the Spirit. And so the words of the prophets still stand. Isaiah said, and it still says, no eye no ear, no heart or mind can figure this out unless the Spirit reveals it. The, the, the gospel, we don't come to the conclusion by thinking, logically, reasoning, and saying, yeah, this all makes sense. I figured it out. It's not through human exploration. It's through spiritual revelation that God has planned to do it this way. And verse 11 helps us understand how this even works. He says there, with a, with a small illustration, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So you think of yourself. You know what you're thinking. You know your motivations. And when you look to the person beside you, you might be able to guess. You might be able to, to give commentary on their life, but you're never really sure. Husbands, apparently you know your wives better than anyone else. But would you dare to claim you know what they're thinking? <laughs> We've been wrong enough to know that only the spirit of the person within them really knows what's going on. Okay? So then he says, and so also, so also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. That's his logic. He says, just like it is with us, only the Spirit of God really knows what God is thinking, what God has planned, why God is doing this, and what he's intending to do. Only the Spirit of God. That means that the Holy Spirit, who partakes of the divine nature, is all-knowing. And verse 10 says, the Spirit searches everything. 
I think it's still speaking of in, in God, although it's all-knowing, the Spirit, He is all-knowing, and yet it goes even as far as the depths of God. He can see, He knows what God has done and what He's doing, what He said, and yet He goes so deep to the depths of God. The Spirit knows God's plans as only the Spirit can. And so verse 12 reminds us then that if that's the case, we have received not the spirit of the world that has no clue about this stuff, but the spirit who is from God. And I would say not just from God, but of God himself. And he gave us this revelation, the spirit to reveal these things. For what purpose? Verse 12 says, that we might understand the things that are freely given to us by God. That which the world cannot figure out, even though God has given it to us in the gospel, the Spirit is given to us, and now we begin to see it. Now we begin to believe it, and to obey it, and to live the right way, wisely, in this world. This is how the wisdom of God is given to us. That the unsearchable riches of the depths of God, has someone has been there. The Spirit has been there. And that Spirit is given to you and me. And we now have access to all the wisdom of God in Christ. It's not that we know everything because we have the Spirit. Verse 12 even limits it to the things freely given us by God, but we are able to understand them. All the things that God has revealed to us in Christ. And furthermore, verse 13 continues, we impart, he's speaking, I think, of the apostles specifically, we impart this to others, to the world, in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. So the Spirit has revealed these things, has taught them these things, and now they're teaching these things because they've learned it from the Spirit. That's the only way that they would know this. And whether from an apostle or from another believer, or from the scriptures, any of us who understands the gospel today, who believes the gospel, we can't claim that we figured it out ourselves. It was an act of God. It was a revelation of the Spirit. No matter who you learned it from, or where you learned it, or how you learned it, it was a revelation ultimately through the Spirit of God. And so we see here that the apostles were the ones who first received the Spirit and then understood and began to teach and to preach the truth. And they pass it on to other believers who, through their preaching, God uses His Spirit or their preaching to, to use His Spirit to unveil to other people what the truth really is. And the Spirit just continues to work. I think that's what it means or implies in verse 13 where it says they interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And even though we don't have the apostles here today with us, we we do. We have their writings. And the way that we know the truth is through the reading, the preaching, the the, the encouragement, the, the, the understanding of the Bible, and the Spirit working through His Word. And so I want to stop here and just... Think about what we've seen so far. There's a lot here, and it's somewhat complicated. Maybe it's just me, but I need to just look again at what we've seen before we finish this passage. So the gospel doesn't sound wise in this world. It doesn't sound like wisdom. It doesn't sound like the best way to live your life. There's other options out there. And as if it could help you live the best life, we say, I, I really don't think that's true. The world doesn't understand this. But Paul says it actually is, whether you believe it or not. The reason why we don't understand this and the world doesn't see this is because they don't recognize it. It's totally foreign. It's unlike all the other things. If you would imagine rows of shelves of products and all of them, they have flashy colors, they have great packaging, they have the right slogans and colors that psychologists say, this is what turns browsers into buyers. They use all of those things. And then the gospel is just kind of on the corner in a brown paper bag. It's kind of how it seems to the world. And yet what they have no idea is what's in that bag. We look at the packaging and we give value to what's inside. And that's the way that the world thinks. But Paul says it's actually not about the packaging, not even the preacher or the preaching. It's not about the moves of the preacher, but the move of the spirit that makes this work. And so he says it is wisdom 
But the world doesn't see it because it's not of this world. It's of God. And that God, before the world began, set in motion his plan. Even over two ages. One age now and one age to come for eternity. And the wisdom of how to live and be prepared for eternal life. All that wisdom to please God is found in Christ crucified. That's what he's saying. He's saying it to the Corinthians. He's saying it to us. That as foolish as it seems, as foolish as it seems for us, from other people's perspective, to look at us and say, why do you keep looking at the scriptures? Why do you keep talking about Jesus? Why do you keep talking about his death and that that's your life? It doesn't make sense to the world. And yet here we are. The wisdom of the world is focused on the here and now. And the wisdom of the gospel is offering us something we can't find anywhere else but through the revelation of the Spirit. And when the Spirit reveals, when God gives us that gift, our eyes are opened. Our ears are opened. Our hearts are opened to see what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no heart has ever imagined before. That is given to us by the Spirit. And when that happens, we are saved, we are indwelt by the Spirit so that we can not just know everything all at once, but we can grow in the knowledge of the wisdom that God has given to us in Christ. And so that's why he says in chapter 1 that in Christ we have everything that we need. We just got to keep looking there. We just got to keep going back. And that's what spiritual people do. So if this is too much, let, let, let's let verses 14 to 16 offer an alternative summary. He says there's two kinds of people in this world. There is first the, the natural person, verse 14, that is those who don't have the spirit. It's those of the world. Those that we all once were. They don't accept, that, uh, that word means to welcome or to receive it. They can understand what we're saying, the words we're saying, and what we're trying to convey, but they don't receive this. It's the same word when, when people said they didn't receive Jesus. They don't receive the things of the Spirit of God. So they hear the gospel and they reject it. It's foolishness to them because they are not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So ultimately, we're thinking of why people ultimately reject the gospel. It is because they don't have the Spirit. They can't understand this. That's a heavy phrase to say, why does someone ultimately reject the gospel? It's because they, they, they can't accept it. They, they need the revelation of the Spirit. But then you have the spiritual person. That's the other kind. It's only two options, the natural and the spiritual. These are the people who have the Spirit of God. And it says there that they judge all things and are themselves to be judged by no one. And, and I think that this means... That they judge all things, meaning everything in this world, every circumstance that you find yourself in, you are able by the Spirit, because of all the knowledge and wisdom of the Spirit within you, we can access the wisdom we need, how to live rightly in this world, how to live life well, how to please God and have everlasting fulfillment. We judge all things. We can say what is good and right, and what is wrong and bad, because we know God's thoughts. And secondly, we are to be judged by no one. I think that means that we don't have to worry about the judgment of the world who don't have the Spirit. When they say, you're not living right, you're living crazy, you're looking like fools, that we don't have to listen to that because we have the Spirit. We know what is right. We know what is good. And so this is how we, he sees it. And the reason he says that we as spiritual people can judge these things and be judged not is because of this in verse 16. This is amazing. It explains that for, he quotes again, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Just like no eye, no ear, no heart, no one can say to God, you know what, I, I think you should have done it this way. I, I, I think it would have been better if you did it this way. I, I think you should do this now. When we say things like this, but do we really know what God is up to? Do we really know his plans and his thoughts? Well, he says here, the spiritual person, the answer to that is no, but the spiritual person, the one who has the Spirit, who knows the depths of God, means that if we have received the Spirit, we have the mind of Christ right there in our lives. And therefore, we can understand 
what the Lord is doing and how to live well in this world as His glorious plan is unfolding in this age and into the age to come. And so we should. And if, if I can leave you with anything, with an encouragement today, I think what Paul is trying to do here is call us to a wise life. The Corinthians had a lot of problems. And I think he set up the foundation here to say, if you guys would realize that you have the Spirit of God, you have access to the wisdom of God, and if you would just mature, he starts with that word in verse 6, this is for the mature, and because you have the Spirit, be mature. You can do this, so do it. I think what he's doing here is calling them to maturity, and I think if they begin to live this way and mature spiritually, that these problems could be solved. This is the foundation for how we should live our lives. We depend on the Spirit. The gospel does sound totally foreign among all the other options in this world. It even seems backwards, but it is real wisdom. And so I invite us, as we begin this new year, and even for the rest of our lives, that we would truly believe this, that we would see that we have the Spirit, and there's so much more that God wants to, that is offering you in your life today, the wisdom you need to live pleasing to the Lord, to know His will and live rightly. This is what God has offered us, and so we are called to be mature, to walk in this way. And if you want wisdom for this year and the rest of your life, to fulfill your purpose and be blessed forever, then ask the Lord to renew your mind as you fill it with Scripture and depend on His Spirit, not only to help you understand it, but to empower you to live it. And so to all who are spiritual, maybe if each of us would just resolve to grow in maturity day by day, through the Word and, through in, and in this church, just imagine the sins that we will avoid Imagine the good that we will do in this world. And imagine the glory that your life will ascribe to your God. Let's pray.